What makes Veblen unique is that where other theorists, including Karl Marx, saw historical evolution and change over time, Veblen saw continuity. He insisted on the continuing presence of violence, predatory behavior, and self-aggrandizement from the past in contemporary capitalist society. These archaic traits of barbarism are now just merely overlaid by what we might deem to be more modern or civilized forms of behavior, which nevertheless preserve the basic kernel of the habitual aversion to menial employments and the glorification of exploitation. Like in early predatory surplus producing societies, the ruling class and capitalism also come to reify you know, its dignified status by abstaining from socially and materially useful labor and instead appropriating a portion of the wealth produced by others. For Veblen, this gives rise in capitalist society to what we might call narcissistic goals focused on the pursuit of status, waste, self-aggrandizement, a desire for admiration and envy. And of course, at the heart of all of this was the accumulation of wealth, which Veblen believed served the social function of impressing the feeling of importance and superiority of its owner vis-a-vis -vis others. The two broad manners in which wealth was flaunted in capitalist society were what Veblen called conspicuous leisure and conspicuous consumption. Of the two, Veblen started with a discussion of conspicuous leisure, um, positing that it was a competitive social practice undertaken for the purpose of acquiring status and displaying pecuniary repute. Veblen argued that since the emergence of private property and the concomitant rise of the social veneration of violence and theft, abstention from labor was seen as a prerequisite for a noble or a freeborn or a respectable man to live a worthy life. Conversely, performing productive work or menial responsibilities resulted in the lowering of one's social esteem and status. By engaging in leisure, therefore, individuals are demonstrating their moral superiority by abstaining from the social degradation of productive work and are able to effectively put on display their wealth which allows them to live a life of idleness. The main difference is that the booty and trophies brandished by warlords in earlier pre-capitalist societies are now replaced with titles of rank, degrees, and insignias that serve of evidence time spent acquiring them instead of time spent on productive labor. When Veblen spoke of leisure, he had in mind more than just the idea of lounging or being lazy. Um, rather, leisure referred to time that an individual spent that was not directed towards any productive end. So this could involve simply wasting one's time, or it could mean any other type of activity that had nothing to do with manual labor per se, but nevertheless involved some mental effort to undertake, such as like sports or academia. Um, furthermore, there was a gradation of leisure that one was expected to engage in, such that the higher up the ranks one climbed in society, the more manual tasks were seen to be incompatible with maintaining one's social standing. So the working class, for example, at least amongst themselves, doesn't face the same magnitude of shame for engaging in productive labor that somebody in a higher class would. This is because for them, labor is a recognized and accepted way of life. So individuals in their class may even take some pride in a job well done, or because labor is the only process available to them to attain wealth, which is also a marker of social status. However, for individuals higher up the social ladder, um, abstention from as many forms of productive labor as possible becomes a paramount form of projecting to the rest of the world that one is powerful and important enough to afford abstaining from manual effort. Think of the Greek philosophers that are venerated to this day, for example. Almost all of them relegated the tasks of physical sustenance to housewives or to slaves. Aristotle even argued in The Politics that society had a natural ordering to it, 
in which slaves naturally lacked the rational capabilities of free men. Thus, their rightful place in society was as instruments of production to serve them by performing menial labor. And Veblen argues that throughout history, we can see the same basic theme of prominent ideologies which deem labor to be a degrading act, primarily performed by the poor and the meek, and therefore incompatible with a life premised on greatness or reaching one's telos. This can even take the form of absurd or irrational expectations that are nevertheless observed for the sake of maintaining the ideological distinctions between the upper and lower classes. So Veblen gives the case, for example, of, quote, Polynesian chiefs who under stress of good form preferred to starve rather than carry their food to their mouths with their own hands, or of a French king who burned to death in front of a fire rather than defile himself with menial labor by getting up and physically moving his chair away from the fire. The act of leisure is immaterial and cannot be flaunted as easily as material possessions. And furthermore, people don't live under the surveillance of others 24 hours a day in order to constantly brandish their ability to engage in leisure. So as a result, Veblen realized that status and esteem would only be conferred onto individuals who were able to prove that they could afford a life of idleness. Primarily, this came in the form of assiduously acquiring habits and behaviors that were accessible through an upper-class lifestyle. One of the most important types of these status-conferring behaviors was manners. For Veblen, manners were a symbolic pantomime of being raised well, of having access to the time and expense implied with an upper-class standing, and of being raised so as to have spent a life spent, to the, uh, spent catering to the spectatorship of and socialization with others in the ruling classes. Veblen tells us that manners require a laborious drill in deportment and taste and discrimination as to what articles of consumption are decorous and the decorous methods of consuming them. And Veblen cites arguments from anthropologists and sociologists that manners are a form of establishing relationships of domination over others in modern or civilized ways with those who are the most punctilious in their conformity to the superficial display of good form being held in the highest esteem by their peers. I mean, for me personally, growing up in the working class and now finding myself in the relatively elite institutions that constitute academia, I found that people from the upper classes um, tend to be much more passive aggressive in their behaviors. Uh, this is basically because like in those circles, that's what's like instinctually considered to be more polite than simply speaking your mind directly. Too much display of emotion or passion also might be looked down upon, I found, as if it was a sign of poor decorum or a breach of the fastidiously observed quietude that for some reason is expected of academics. Veblen would argue that my feeling like a black sheep in these circles is due to the fact that people from the working class simply have not been socialized to navigate these circles or to read between the lines when it comes to parsing and analyzing the culture and the etiquette that shapes their behavior. In the extreme, we stand apart from the crowd as degenerates, branded as deviant others who are not welcome in certain social spaces. As Veblen would argue, manners are a phenomenon originated by and for the leisure class in order to put on display the acquired forms of behavior afforded by their privileged lifestyle. It is a world that myself and millions or billions of others were quite literally not born to fit into. In addition to manners, a leisurely lifestyle can manifest itself in myriad other forms of behaviors, habits, or skills that imply ample money and time spent abstaining from productive labor in order to acquire them. This might include um, being musically talented, having time to spend on hiking or being in nature, knowing how to dress in a way that is considered fashionable, being talented at sports, or knowing how to conform to the etiquette required in particular professions and society more broadly.
And these patterns of behavior and social interaction all serve as an implicit signal to the rest of the world that one is from the upper class and that they have had access to the time, money, and institutions designed to raise them in a way such that they emerge bearing the distinctive hallmarks of hailing from a higher pedigree. Some have argued that conspicuous leisure has declined as the conventional means of displaying wealth relative to the time when Veblen was writing. But perhaps we might say instead that it's merely changed form in the contemporary era. While knowledge of dead languages or maintaining racehorses may have been a ubiquitous symbol of wealth in Veblen's time, today we have carefully cultivated social media accounts boasting of one's vacations to exotic places, unpaid internships and other forms of networking, expensive private universities, or resource and time in intensive hobbies like golfing. Conspicuous leisure, therefore, remains a prominent cultural theme that the upper classes utilize to establish their status and draw a distinction between themselves and the working class. Veblen was writing the theory of the leisure class in the 1890s when the consumer boom in the United States was just starting to gain pace. He explained this rise of consumerism by arguing that as societies developed, consumption becomes an even more important way to display wealth compared to leisure. Um, this is primarily because as communities become less tight-knit, the prevalence of gossip and networks becomes relatively diminished, and with it, so did the ability to garner status through one's reputation for having a leisurely lifestyle. As a result, the paragon of advertising one's wealth pivoted to what Veblen called conspicuous consumption, which was an ostentatious flaunting of wealth through the consumption of material goods, such as luxurious food, clothing, housing, and furniture. Um, like conspicuous leisure, conspicuous consumption was also premised on a veneration of the unproductive, meaning that the wealthy were willing to pay a premium for functionally equivalent goods, or even goods that were frivolous and wasteful and therefore had little practical use. Indeed, the more wasteful a commodity was from the standpoint of practicality, or the higher its price, the more it redounded to the possessor's social esteem, because in this way, the consumption properly marked itself as an act of exclusivity, something that individuals did because they could afford the higher price or because they could afford to waste their money on purposeless goods. So the artifacts of conspicuous consumption oftentimes lack all social use, or are extravagantly luxurious and therefore priced higher than other goods that serve a functional equivalent, such as, for example, a mansion versus a normal house. Both of them serve the purpose of providing dwelling, but clearly the mansion is superfluously luxurious. They are also often deliberately flashy or showy, designed to display one's pecuniary status in an obvious and unavoidable way. So some of the things that we might associate with conspicuous consumption include things like mansions with lit driveways coming up to the house, diamonds and other fancy jewelry, luxurious foods, or brand name clothing. Um, another prominent example is great works of art. And they're a great example because oftentimes the greatness of a work of art is not fully established until it's been appraised to be of a high price. So in other words, something that only the upper classes can afford. Fancy bread pets are another example of the commodities that the wealthy consume to display their status, and especially because of the social status implied by their pure breed. Veblen argued that the wealthy preferred purebred dogs to cats in particular because dogs had been bred to be especially good at obedience and subservience to their masters, compared to cats, who tended to be more independent. Um, so therefore, dogs better reinforce the hierarchy of domination that conspicuous consumption is founded on. We might also see the wealthy spend their money on frivolous goods that serve no practical purpose, including advertising, 
uh, luxury household decorations, plastic surgery, and all sorts of trinkets, knickknacks, and amulets. Lawns are a particularly salient example of wealth in modern U.S. culture because they are the biggest monoculture crop in the U.S. and consume insane amounts of water and other resources solely for the purpose of decoration. What conferred status was in constant flux. As societies changed, so did the ways to display wealth in a socially acceptable manner. Some items, such as cars, may at first confer status as a rare and elite commodity, but may later become ubiquitously owned and confer no status unless if it was of a particular luxury brand. But as a general principle, the more wasteful something was, the least practical function that something served, and the more its price reflected a superfluous costliness, the more it touted the possessor's superior social status. One of the most important ways that individuals engage in conspicuous consumption is through their clothing. Bevelin devoted an entire chapter in the theory of the leisure class to clothing, arguing that no other form of consumption so prominently displayed the concepts of exclusivity in taste and waste as the ways that we dress ourselves. Because it is prominently displayed on our bodies, clothing serves as a very obvious signal of one's social and financial status. In particular, um, conforming to a respectable appearance requires that one have access to adequate time and a particular social background in order to have an understanding of what is conventionally regarded as good taste in the first place. Historically speaking, Bevelin argued that an important component of what made something fashionable was whether it demonstrated that the wearer is not fit for productive labor. For example, ironed and spotless garments, linen, patent leather shoes, corsets, high heels, skirts, and during Veblen's time, the top hat were all insignia of the upper classes because they suggested that the wearer had no personal contact with industrial processes of any kind. These articles of clothing simply cannot stand up to the wear and tear or physical demands of manual labor. They therefore serve the double purpose of showing that not only can the wearer afford to consume expensive garments, but that he or she can afford to consume without producing. Clothing also serves to conspicuously display one's financial ability to engage in waste. That's because one of the most important aspects of being considered well-dressed is having clothes that are up to date with contemporary fashion. But you'd be hard pressed to argue that the clothing of a few decades ago with different fashion is intrinsically worse than the clothing of today simply because styles have changed. So constant expenditure on dress is justified not through constant improvement which e with each new clothing line or iteration, but rather to engage in conspicuous waste by constantly discarding perfectly functional and practical garments in exchange for new ones as dictated by changing social customs and fashions. Veblen's theory of conspicuous consumption strikes at the heart of one of the most fundamental theories in mainstream economics, which is the theory of demand. In mainstream economics, it is assumed that an individual's demand for a commodity is determined by their own personal tastes and preferences, and that these tastes and preferences are static. They don't change over time or due to fluctuating social customs. In this theory, these tastes and preferences are determined exogenously from the model, or in other words, determined independently of whatever else is going on in society. And demand is simply a relationship between the individual and the price of a commodity. In fact, assuming this about consumer behavior allows mainstream economists to map a linear downward sloping relationship between price and quantity demanded. If tastes and preferences were socially determined, it would be hard to parse out whether demand was changing due to a change in prices or due to a collective social change in tastes and preferences. But Veblen argues just that. 
that social customs and ideologies shape an individual's taste and preferences for commodities in the first place. This is because consumption is seen to be primarily a social act in Veblen's theory, undertaken in order to broadcast to others that one is respectable, can afford in both time and money to keep up with the Joneses, and can afford a decent amount of conspicuous waste. Furthermore, the desire of the upper classes to competitively garner social esteem by purchasing luxurious and wasteful items sets in motion a cascading effect throughout society in which individuals and lower classes nevertheless feel pressure to emulate the consumption habits of the wealthy lest they fail to adequately establish respectability amongst their peers. This is perhaps why we see the proliferation of different tiers of brand name goods when it comes to social status. Some, such as Gucci, are seen as affordable only by the elite, while some, such as Lacoste, are seen as the arena of the upper middle class. I mean, Gucci down, Gucci. You wearing Lacoste shit, bitch, yeah, my club. Um, cheaper mimicry of luxury goods, such as different types of jewelry, uh, straight up counterfeit brand name goods, or the emulation of certain consumption patterns, such as filling one's home with useless decorations or gravitating towards certain types of cars if one wants to display status. The commodities that people come to desire in capitalist society are in many cases pointless, wasteful, and are unjustly tied to one's perceived worth as a human being. Furthermore, in revealing this emulative cascading effect, which we'll discuss in the next section, Veblen made a unique contribution to our theoretical understanding of why the most marginalized and victimized by capitalist society have in many cases failed to revolt. Many theorists, including Marx, thought that the working class would instinctively revolt when faced with the extravagances of the ruling class who lived from appropriating their labor. After all, it was in their own self-interest to do so. But Veblen's theory of emulative consumption and leisure provides one explanation for why, in many cases, this has failed to come to fruition. Emulative consumption is the idea that individuals in the lower rungs of society view the level of consumption engaged in by the upper classes as the ideal lifestyle or ideal standard of decency that they should adhere to. Therefore, they expend their energies to live up to that ideal. Each social class tries to emulate the, consumpti you know, the consumption behavior of the class above it to the extent that even the poorest people and even the consumption of relatively private commodities such as undergarments or kitchen appliances are subjected to these pressures to conform to the ideals of costliness and luxury as synonyms for respectability and being well-liked. Veblen argues that emulative consumption happens because we are all social and political animals. It is natural and human to want to be respected and included in social gatherings. And in capitalist society, unfortunately, a significant portion of how we are judged as being respectable and fit for social life does revolve around our consumption habits. Collectively, we tend to look down on people who don't earn very much, assuming that they suffer from some sort of individual defect that keeps them from acquiring more wealth. And numerous peer-reviewed studies have shown that wealthy people tend to be perceived as more trustworthy and motivated, along with a whole slew of other positive personal traits. So going back to Veblen's theory of the ideological origins of private property, in which violence and appropriation by force were seen as laudable and respectable traits, the theory of emulative consumption posits that we desire to emulate the behaviors of the wealthy because they are held in popular imagination to be our superiors. Inevitably, this engenders a classist ideological paradigm in which wealth itself is rendered synonymous with virtue. As Veblen states, these ideas become pervasive and dominate the culture. Quote, those members of the community who fail to, who fall short of this consumption standard suffer in the esteem of their fellow men. And consequently, they also suffer in their own esteem, since the usual basis of self-respect is the respect accorded by one's neighbors. 
Only individuals with an aberrant temperament can in the long run retain their self-esteem in the face of the disesteem of their fellows. The result is that the working class clings to consumption in an attempt to emulate the upper class habits accepted as a sign of social respectability. By idolizing the upper classes and giving them the power to set the standards for what is considered decent or acceptable, workers therefore also uncritically accept the social relations implied within capitalism. The consumption habits of the upper classes made possible only because of their parasitic extraction of wealth from the lower classes is upheld as the ideal standard to strive towards rather than it being seen as a byproduct made possible only through the exploitation of workers and therefore inaccessible to the vast majority of people. Therefore, capitalist ideologies result in the perception that the ultimate form of empowerment and means of acceptance by others is based on a materialistic and hedonistic treadmill in which the quantity and quality of commodities consumed determines the standard of what's considered a good life and even a good person. In turn, the systems of power that facilitate the concentration of wealth go unchallenged hidden beneath the crass facade of anxious efforts to keep up with social trends. Thorstein Babelin was a titan in the field of heterodox economics for the unique ways that he blended anthropology, sociology, and other social sciences in order to analyze the self-indulgent, judgmental, and mercilessly competitive patterns of behavior that he believed were socially deleterious. The degradation of labor and the glorification of status acquired through force were defining characteristics of societies premised on private property and were also responsible for the ideological justification of the disenfranchisement of the vast majority of people who created all of the wealth in society to begin with. In contemporary mainstream economics, the vast majority, if not all, economic processes and outcomes are attributed to individual level rational choices which are assumed to be made in order to maximize the well-being of individuals making those choices, and therefore, by implication, society as a whole. Veblen's thinking, therefore, serves as an important antidote to the particular strain of economics that has all but foreclosed on the possibility of social customs and ideologies influencing individuals to make irrational, wasteful, and harmful decisions about how to allocate their economic resources. His thinking also illuminates a path forward for overthrowing systems of oppression rooted in capitalism that collectively keep us bound to a hedonistic treadmill as a means of establishing our worth in the eyes of other human beings. It starts with all of us taking the opportunity to question the assumption that the rat race is the highest form of society that we can ascribe to and to replace it with more meaningful social relations premised on compassion, solidarity, and a collective sense of responsibility for the future of humanity and the planet.